Good morning. Uh, this morning's reading will be from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 11. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 11. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises in order that by them you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence, in your faith supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence knowledge, and in your knowledge self-control, and in your self-control perseverance, and in your perseverance godliness, and in your godliness brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness love, for the, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble, for in this way the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for such rich text. Thank you that you did not leave us uh, to be corrupted by this world. Lord, you provided a way to uh, grow in fellowship with you and with, with you and with others, Lord for now and for eternity. So I just thank you, Lord, and I pray for each one of us, Lord, that we would grasp hold of that and be led by your spirit and just uh, grow in fellowship with you, Lord, and all the ways that you desire for us and, and to be increasing, Lord, from uh, in this life and for eternity. And for your glory, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Good to be with you and uh, excited to dive into the word this morning with you. But real quick, pray for my wife, if you would. Uh, she has been battling something for about three to four weeks, and she's not with us this morning. Matter of fact, she's in urgent care right now. Uh, last night, she was coughing so hard, she felt something pop in her chest. And so she's getting an x-ray done. And so we don't know. She's had blood work done, and they're doing x-rays. So it's kind of a mystery, but she really hasn't been sleeping for the past three to four weeks. And I don't know about you, but when you go without sleep, uh, it's, it's not a good thing. And uh, constant cough and uh, pray for not only some, uh, some medical wisdom to come forth, pray for her also to accept the fact that she needs to rest and relax. And that's what I encourage her to do today. So uh, one of the things that really makes people go to sleep is watching golf. So we're gonna watch golf later together. <laughs> And uh, I'll probably give her a couple beers and uh, wake her up 24 hours from now, all right? So um, pray for her if you would. So thank you for, for doing that, and we'll be sure to keep you guys posted. So uh, turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Here's a clue. It comes before 2 Timothy, just in case you need a little orientation. 1 Timothy. Um, so this week, the Victory Fridges in Cleveland were open. And if you don't know what the victory fridges are, oh Lord, look out. So Bud Light put a bunch of victory refrigerators in all these bars throughout Cleveland, and they were all on lock until the Cleveland Browns won a game. Do you know how long it's been since the Cleveland Browns have won a football game? 635 days. Matter of fact, Cleveland Browns fans were so disappointed in their team, they've almost grown apathetic and complacent about their, their, their very own hometown sports team. One guy in his will wrote this, that I want, as my pallbearers, six players from the Cleveland Browns so that they can let me down one last time. That's how bad these guys are. And so they finally won a game this past week. You would think they won the Super Bowl, but it was just one game and the victory fridges were open. There was a, there was a bacchanalia happening in Cleveland this past week. 
People didn't know what to do with themselves all because of one win after a series of 635 days of drought. Have you ever have you ever celebrated something like that where you waited so long for something that you're yearning for something that you could taste it and when it finally happens you just you just throw all abandon to the wind and just go this is the best moment ever. You know, I was thinking about the celebration of these fans and and this is this is celebration over a football team. This is celebration over a win. And I'm thinking to myself what do we as, as believers in Christ celebrate? What is it that, that gets us excited? What's the, what's the victory fridge of the Spirit in our hearts that when it's opened up, we're just like, wah! And I go, I wonder if we even celebrate at all. You know, I wonder if we as believers have, have been through seasons of drought. We, we don't know what the exuberance of joy looks like in, in following Christ. I think so many people follow Jesus out of duty that they've lost the sense of delight. I think a lot of people have lost the, the joy. They, they, they've reduced perhaps Christianity to this, this set of maxims, to this set of rules where it's just become more legalistic and law-based than, than really something born of the Spirit. And, and I want us to celebrate as believers in Christ. I want us to tap into those deep desires of joy and, and those deep hungers for, for thirsting for righteousness and, and, and something exciting that's beyond ourselves. And, and I get the opportunity today to start us on a journey for the next 10 weeks uh, where we get to look at the spiritual disciplines. See, God has given us things to promote joy in our spirits. God has given us things that, that we can celebrate over. And, and I, I'm afraid that most of us uh, don't know what joy in Jesus is like. We don't know what it's like when we read the Bible and we see men and women skipping and hopping and, and singing hallelujah to God. And we're like, we want that. We want to taste that. We want to, we want to enjoy God. And yet, we tend to be, as a contemporary church, missing that peace. And, and I think it's probably because many of us are overcommitted to things, and especially church things. There was one church I read about where they met and talked about what is required for membership at their church. And the, the bottom line was that you had to commit to five to seven things per week at that church to become a member. And I'm thinking to myself, I wouldn't want to be a bar, part of that club. I wouldn't want to join that church. And, and I wonder how many of us are overcommitted to things that may on paper look well and good. Maybe they're rooted in the Bible, but maybe we've allowed empty activity to take the place of that deep spiritual intimacy of joy and connection with God. Write these three letters down if you would. C-F-S. Because I think most of us have this disease, C-F-S. Christian fatigue syndrome. How many of us have grown up in traditions where it was all about just doing activity? As long as we're busy for Jesus, we're good, right? You know, like that bumper sticker says, Jesus is coming, look busy, right? Like, this is our mentality. But before you can do, you really have to be. Right? God's created us not human doings, but human beings. And the spiritual disciplines is something that has got a hold of my life 30 years ago. And I want to share this with you because God wants more for us. And this is not about religious activity, and this is not about rule keeping, and this is not about legalism. This is something that, that God wants us to embrace and understand. And if most of us were asked about spiritual disciplines, most of us would just have a big question mark over our heads. And so I want to clear up a little bit of the mystery. I want to, I want to help cure the, the CFS in all of our hearts. And, and I think it's through spiritual disciplines. There's a lot of us here that are young in the faith. And there's a lot of us here who have been walking with Jesus for a long time. This is a topic that's good for all of us. Because spiritual disciplines are not things you perfect. They're not things you complete. There's not, they're not things that like, oh, okay, I graduated from Bible 101. What's, what's next? 
But these are things we continually have to walk in. And so there's two things we're going to talk about this morning. Quickly, we're going to talk about our problem. And that is we are spiritually discouraged. There's spiritual discouragement. And secondly, the most focus of our time is going to be on God's provision, spiritual disciplines. So why are we spiritually discouraged? What's our problem? Four things I can think of as I was, I was just, just kind of reflecting on this topic. Number one is that we're distant. We're distant from God. And this is a fruitless, futile conversation if you don't start this journey with Jesus. I'm not going to give you a bunch of religious practices as if I'm some yogi that lives in Sedona who's saying, you want to channel your inner chakras with the cosmos? Follow these eight paths of enlightenment steps. These are nothing if you don't have Christ. So distance from God is solved on his end by sending his son to die for us and building a bridge to intimacy with him. Amen? Let's be clear, this is about the gospel. And so we are distant, we need God desperately, and we cannot start to do religious practices until we first know the person of God. And he has made himself known to us in the person work of Jesus Christ. Amen? Secondly, here's the next problem, and I hate to just be the, the guy that just addresses this. We're distracted. We are distracted. We are focused on the things that do not matter. Our primary problem in contemporary culture is distraction. And we are easily wooed away by the, by the dog with the fluffy tail and we're easily drawn away by the, the show we need to binge watch and we're easily drawn away by a, 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 a volatile uh, political climate and we're focusing on things that do not ultimately matter in time and eternity. We're, we're distracted and pulled away from the things that we need to be dealing with in our own hearts. Neuroscience studies are now showing that the neural pathways of our brains are being rewired accordingly so that our physical capacity for sustained attention is decreasing. Studies are coming forth saying all the smartphones, all the iPads, all the computers, all the streaming networks and services, all this stuff is doing more to kill us than to make us better. And so we are distracted. We are technological gluttons. And we need to stop. The spiritual disciplines will help us in that. Number three, we're dissatisfied. The things that we thought were going to bring us joy, don't. The things that we are involved in that we thought were going to bring us happiness, don't. The things that we've surrounded our lives with that we thought were going to bring us purpose, don't. We are deeply dissatisfied and nothing that we have surrounded our lives with is able to bring about the deep character transformation that we are hungry for. Those things don't do that. There is a gnawing hunger for spiritual realities that none of the stuff in this world that, that we fill our lives with is going to help out with. So there's a gnawing hunger that only Christ can satisfy. There's a hunger for something of spiritual substance. You know what the curse of our age is? Superficiality. The world does not want rich people. The world does not want pretty people. The world does not want successful people. You know what the world wants? Deep people. Last but not least, we're disobedient. <laughs> Let's just call it what it is. Sometimes God shows us something and we simply don't want to do it. Any disobedient jerks out there like me? It's like, la, 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 God, I can't hear you. You know, oh, I, I didn't see that one, Lord. Like, we just are rebellious in our hearts, and God says, get over yourselves. You're, you're dissatisfied and you're discontented because you don't obey me. And so those are just four things I was thinking about as I'm reflecting on myself and us as a culture. This is, this is our problem. We are spiritually discouraged, and I think these things feed that. So what's God's provision? 
I'm going to tell you right now, there is a buttload of verses today, okay? So get ready. I literally, I, the, the guys in the back are entering the, these verses and they're like, you better go through all these verses. Like they've been here since 6 a.m. entering verses. So we're going to fly through a bunch of verses and I want you to write these down because this is going to be helpful for you this week as you review God's provision. What is God's provision? What has he given to us so that we can satisfy that deep gnawing spiritual hunger? What is that that God has given us that we can be those deep people that he wants us to be? Spiritual disciplines. So today is introduction. And over the next nine weeks, we're going to talk about specific spiritual disciplines, such as the Bible, such as prayer, such as worship, such as fasting, solitude, reflection, and silence such as evangelism, such as service, and, and why we do the things that God has called us to do. Because here's the aim of it. It's ultimately not the practice of those things. It is to glorify God and to live in his presence. And so we'll unpack these things specifically next week, but we need to lay a solid foundation this morning because what we have to understand is we're not going to get anywhere in our spiritual lives without discipline. We need this. And just so you know, Without Christ, we are all equally disadvantaged in this topic. You cannot sit there and go, well, you're a pastor and you're formally theologically trained. No, 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 no. Romans chapter 3 says none of us seeks after God. None of us wants Him. None of us even care for Him. We're all equally spiritually disadvantaged. But with Christ, we're all equally advantaged in this pursuit. Right? We all stand on level ground before the cross. High fives all the way around. Right? I am no better than you because I went to seminary or like some kids say cemetery. Who wants to hang out there, right? We all have Jesus and you have Jesus. You have more than you'd ever thought imaginable to walk with your God. Education aside, experience aside, you have Christ. We are all equally advantaged in this. And so God gives us these dis- disciplines to deep us, deepen our love for him. And these are going to be very specific disciplines that we talk about that are going to be true for every one of us. Not one of us can say, I'm going to opt out of that class. Right? These are all things that are pertinent for our lives. And the disciplines are not the end. They are a means to the end so that you will walk with Christ and enjoy his company. So several points here. The first is this. The disciplines and the plan. Why? Why did God give us these instructions? Because his ultimate goal is to make you like Christ. Think about this. Like, were you ever asked as a child, what are you going to be when you grow up? So you maybe as an adult are being asked that today. What do you, you want to be when you grow up? If you would have asked me when I was a, when I was a teenager... You would have been looking at this buck-toothed kid with this horrible bowl haircut. What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a rock star. Like, that was me. Right? So I was listening to ACDC and Black Sabbath and playing my guitar in my room and joining every garage rock band I could. That was my dream. Until God got a hold of my heart. And you know, God has a plan for you as you grow up. And what's his plan for you? To conform you into the image of Jesus Christ. (laughs) <laughs> this is awesome. Romans 8, 29. Check out this verse. Paul says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. And to those he predestined, he predestined them to be conformed to the image of his Son. Why has God even chosen you and set his love upon you? So that you would be going through this process of conformity Not to the world, not to your career, not to your vocation, not to that thing you got a degree in that may be worth it or worth less, I don't know. But there's one thing I know when it comes to who you are spiritually, if you're in Christ, here's God's end game. Conformity into the image of Christ. This is why Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from, the, from one degree of glory to another. We are being conformed into the image of Christ. So Paul in Romans 8, Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul in Colossians chapter 3, verse 10 says this, And we have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Notice the language in these texts. 
there is an image in which God is molding you into. And God has saved you for this purpose. He has not saved you to go to heaven. He has not saved you to avoid hell. He has saved you to make you more like Christ. This is, a, this is an aha moment. Like if we understood that, that there's this process in place now where God is going to achieve this, and if we haven't bought into it or adopted it, we're missing out on the very plan that God has for our lives in Christ. Check out this verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 and 18. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comp comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. I love that. Like God is just stripping away and making us into new creatures and the fullness of this renewal process will not be fully experienced until we meet him face to face. But the renewal's happening right here, right now. How about this last verse? 1 John 3, verse 2. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. So what's great is all the work that God is doing in this plan to conform us into the image of Christ, when we see him one day, when we are in his presence one day, there will be this realization and reward that the submission to God's plan and process was worth it because we're more like Christ. Right? Like, wow! The resemblance. The, the identification, the, the connection is going to be so wonderful. So this is God's plan. This is why this is important. Because the disciplines help us submit to God's ultimate plan, conformity to Christ. There is nothing more worthy of your time as a believer in Christ than to understand God's work toward this end. Amen? Number two, how about the disciplines and the purpose? So there's the ultimate plan of conformity to Christ. What's the purpose perhaps here and now? Well, this is where we come to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Check this out in your Bibles if you, if you have it open. 1 Timothy 4. But have nothing, Paul says in verse 7, to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. Oh, how dare Paul take a stab at the older ladies. Come on. On the other hand, notice, he says, don't buy into the world's philosophy of like, here's what you need to be satisfied. Here's what you need to be content. He says this, on the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. There's the goal. That God is working something in your life now for the purpose of godliness. It is not to memorize all 66 books of the Bible. It's not to pray uh, you know, perfectly like Jesus prayed. It's not to, to serve so perfectly with, with, with unselfish motives. It's not to share your faith with somebody who doesn't know Christ and to share the, the gospel. For, it's, it's godliness. Because look at verse 8. For bodily discipline is only of little profit. Anything external focus is, is, is not worth it. But godliness, the thing that happens on the inside, is profitable for all things since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Right? Like, C.S. Lewis was the one who, who penned these words. He said, if you focus only on this world, in the end, you not only lose this one and the next, but if you focus on the next world, you gain this world and the next. So what do we have to understand when it comes to the purpose of the disciplines? Notice the word Paul uses in verse 7, train. Circle that word, train. This means you are to exercise. This means you are to work out. And what's amazing is that it is speaking of intense urgency. Like your health is at stake. And you need to go to God's gym and exercise your butt off. Now Paul's writing in a context where sports 
was something that everyone enjoyed. And I love all the sports allegories found throughout the New Testament because Paul especially likes sports. Now, here's the good news for us. Our athletes today compete with clothes on. Back in Paul's day, they were naked. Which is maybe why I appeal to a much broader audience. I don't know. But literally, they competed naked because they thought themselves to be so good at what they did, they did not want anything to encumber their performance. This is why you have passages like 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul says this, For every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. So notice Paul saying, you need to bring an athletic mindset to your spirituality because there's men and women out there, they are training for hours upon hours upon hours to compete for what? A, a trophy? A, a ribbon? A medal? Which one day those things will die away and they'll fade away and they'll disappear. But we, as athletes in Christ, compete for a wreath that is imperishable and I do not run aimlessly he says I do not box as one beating the air but I discipline my body and keep it under control lest after preaching to others I myself should be disqualified meaning I want to be faithful in what God's called me to do and as any athlete will do adopt a very stringent lifestyle to say I want to be faithful to the Lord and what he's called me to do to the end which is why the writer of Hebrews brings such a wonderful word into this. Look at this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. You don't see a person doing track and field with a full suit on. That would be really weird, right? They've got these like loafers and this tie and they're like, we'd be like, that's foolish. You don't see them kind of coming around for the baton thing and a guy like with a hostess donut stand saying, here you go, here's what you need for the race. Like, you know, Jim Belushi, remember that skit, Little Chocolate Donuts? Like, we don't do things that are going to encumber us. We don't do things that are going to, to, to slow us down. See, the intense, the agonizing spirit required to follow Christ, it's, it's, it's there. And I, and I want you to, here's something I thought of, and I thought of this phrase, and I, I really like this. This is more than external aptitude. This is about internal fortitude. That's good. Tweet moment of the day, I think so. We are not talking about external aptitude. We are talking about internal fortitude. It was G.K. Chesterton, great Catholic theologian, contemporary of C.S. Lewis, who said, it's not that Christianity has been tried and found wanting. It has been wanted because it has not been tried. Walking with Christ and being his disciple, ladies and gentlemen, it is not an easy road. Any one of you who have, have wa walked with Christ for any amount of time will realize it is a difficult journey. And this is why this internal fortitude is so key. This is why Paul in Corinth, uh, Colossians chapter 2 says these words. You guys, we're not even done with the verses yet. How are you guys doing? Your hands cramping yet? Check this out. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why is it that you're still alive in the world? Do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? Now notice that. This is external righteousness. Paul is condemning. This is not about getting your external house in order. This is not the external, you know, oh, look at him. He brought his, he brought his big Bible to church. This is not about external stuff. Oh, he prayed a five-minute prayer at the last Thanksgiving meal with his family. This is not about external stuff. See, Paul is dismissing external righteousness and he wants to focus on the heart. This is why he says, according to human perception teaching, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. So Paul says, 
There are things that do battle with our hearts and these are the things we need to do because our, our hearts are a battlefield. There's so many competing desires and voices that we need to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness. Because everything in this world is aimed at you not being godly. And the goal, again, is godliness. P uh, Kevin read this at 2 Peter this morning. Great passage. Chapter 1, verse 6. Let me remind you. With knowledge comes self-control, self-control, steadfastness, steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness. Like Peter even agrees with Paul and says, listen, the end result is godliness. So God's purpose is to grow us in godliness. Godliness is just another word of saying holiness. Just another way of saying sanctification. It's just another way of saying Christ-likeness. And this is an internal work. It's like an iceberg. You guys ever seen... Uh, an iceberg in real life or a picture. I mean, notice the picture of the iceberg right here. Here's what's amazing about the iceberg. We see what's on the surface, and yet there's so much more that lies beneath the surface of the water. And this is so appropriate in, in illustrating our lives. See, we all see the tip of the iceberg with one another. Rarely do we expose what's lying beneath the surface to each other. Why? Because we're afraid of judgment, we're afraid of condemnation, we're afraid of being mocked or ridiculed. We, we have to realize that God does His work below the surface of the water. God is not concerned about what everyone sees, He's concerned about what is going on where no one sees that only He can see. And I'm going to tell you guys something right now that we, we must understand that a person's life, the vast majority of who you are, lies beneath the surface. And yet we're just focused on externals. No wonder we're dissatisfied. No wonder we're, we're discontent. Because discipleship is inviting God to the deep places that you don't see. Discipleship is, is allowing God to bring awareness to the core of who we are. Where the, where the real transformation takes place where we are naked before Him and we, are, are, uh, we realize that there's nothing to hinder His eyes from seeing who I truly am. And if there's one thing I know about the disciplines is that they invite God to those hidden places where He doesn't condemn us, it's where He changes us. He knows you already. He wouldn't have saved your wretched butt if he, if he knew, you know, all this stuff you're trying to hide. He knows it and he still loves you. Amen? Wretched butt. That's a, that's a good... Jorgen, we need to write a song called that, right? You know yourselves. I know myself. I'm wretched. And yet there's a God who demonstrates his own love towards me that while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. And if he knows me in my lowest, most deplorable and despicable state, how much more does he save me and say, I want to renew you and revive you and restore you. Ladies and gentlemen, someone once said, the longest journey of any person is the journey inward. The most glorious thing you can do as a human being is allow God below the surface and do the work on your heart that only He can do. Because He will bring about godliness. He will bring about holiness. He will bring about conformity to Christ's likeness because this is what God does. Which brings us to our next point, the disciplines and the process. Here's where we're going to camp out because this is it. What is the process in which God does this work? Because I'm going to tell you right now, the, the process is somewhat of a mystery. Because any work of God in our hearts is really a gift from Him. Because the process requires us almost to do nothing. Which seems kind of counterintuitive. But I said kind of doing nothing because if there's one thing I know for God to grow godliness in us is for us to do the one thing and that is submit to His process. Which comes about in Romans chapter 12 verse 1 and 2. Notice these verses. 
I appeal to you, brothers, sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Will you show up and put yourself on the altar of God and let him do with you whatever he wants to do with you? Right? The sacrifice doesn't have a say in what, in what's going to happen. The sacrifice doesn't have a, a recommendation or, hey, I would advise you to do this. Or, can I suggest this? A sacrifice is exactly that. It is something that is placed upon the altar and the person doing the sacrificing does the work. This is your spiritual act of worship, Paul says. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. So could it be we have bought into a whole process of discipleship and disciplines that is not biblical? We've surrounded ourselves with lots of good activity, but we're missing the result of just being in relationship with a God that we are called to trust, that we are called to believe in, and we are called to say, here's my life, Lord, do with it what you will. Write this verse down, Philippians chapter 2. I love this because he says, Paul says, you know, beloved, you've always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So now this brings in this cooperative idea that we work with God when it comes to conformity into the image of Christ. But do not forget, it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Right? We participate, but we have to know the limits of our participation. Why we do what we do, motivation, huge. And so what I may suggest to you are three pictures. And I want you to write down three words that are rooted in scripture, that are given to us from nature, that will give us an idea of the process. And I'm going to tell you right now, again, that the process reminds us that God's work is really ultimately beyond our control, but we still participate in it. And the three pictures are this. The farmer, the embryo, and the caterpillar. Aww. We get to get all nature-like on you this morning. The farmer. See, the farmer is involved in a process called reaping and sowing. Sowing and reaping. Galatians chapter 6, verse 8. See, what the farmer has control of is preparing the soil. What the farmer has no control of is the weather, the soil, the seed being permeated with rain, the growth of whatever seed he has planted. Do you realize that the farmer only does a certain portion, but ultimately it is out of his control for the rest. And yet God calls us to realize that we are called to participate at a certain level and then leave the rest to God. How about the embryo? Think about this verse in Galatians chapter 4, verse 19. It's not up on the screen. I thought I'd give the guys in back a little bit of break. Amen? Paul prays that Christ be formed in us. The word formed is a term we associate with the embryo growing in the mother's womb. And Paul says, here is this embryo, and we are amazed at the, the process of conception. And we're amazed at the process of, of pregnancy. And we're amazed at the process of birth. Can I tell you, as a man, I had the easiest part of the job. Having three children. And yet, here's mama carrying this baby. And yet there was so much that she couldn't control. Right? Even though she is the carrier of this little alien, I mean child. She's the carrier of this thing. Right? She's providing the, the environment, but there was so much beyond her control, and yet something was happening. Something was growing. This is why the psalmist celebrates, you knew me in my, in, my, in my mother's womb. You knew it as you were forming my inward parts in Psalm 139. 
right? There's, there's a thing that we participate in, but ultimately there's a larger aspect of control that only God holds. How about this process of a caterpillar that becomes a butterfly, right? This idea of metamorphosis, not the Franz Kafka metamorphosis, but more natural, biological metamorphosis. Paul writes about this in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. We already read it up on the screen. The renewal of your mind, that word renewal is literally metamorphosis. And the mystery that's involved with a caterpillar basically instinctively knowing to crawl up into this thing called a cocoon that is dark, submitting to process beyond its control, and emerging from this dark catacomb where now the caterpillar has turned into this beautiful butterfly right this this idea this weird multi-legged hairy little thing crawls into this cocoon 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 and emerges with colors and wings and flies god says that's the process that these things are beyond your control A baby cannot transform itself. A caterpillar cannot transform itself. The farmer has no control over what sort of harvest he or she will yield. But here's the beauty of it all. We have to accept that we cannot transform ourselves. You are powerless to change who you are in Christ. And that is a tough thing to accept. And the, and the reason we don't accept it is because we're raised in a pull yourself up by your bootstraps culture and the disciplines teach us that you cannot do this work you can submit to the processes but you have to wait upon the lord amen three things i think of when it comes to the process that are going to be so important for us as we look at these things more specifically number one these disciplines are means of receiving grace And you may ask, well, haven't we received grace in Christ already once, once we're saved? Can I tell you? You are designed to receive grace from God on a daily basis. And when you put yourself in God's presence, when you place yourself on the altar of God, when you put yourself out there for God, it is those very channels that God gives you His grace. I love how Spurgeon said it. He said, I must take care, take above all that I cultivate communion with Christ. For though that can never be the basis of my peace, yet it will be the channel of it. See, we have to understand the the disciplines help us receive God's grace. Secondly, they're the means of godly transformation. God will not transform you outside the spiritual disciplines. The disciplines are practices that God has given to us to change us to the image of Christ. Men and women throughout the ages who who love Jesus have adopted these things and they will tell you that there is no exception. You must embrace these practices for spiritual maturity to take place in our lives. Number three, they are the means to spiritual freedom. You want to be free and yet maybe have an experience of freedom that comes in Christ? You need to understand this when it comes to spiritual disciplines. You're going to like this. You are most free when you are most bound. Let me illustrate. And, and it's the character of the binding that matters. So there's an athlete out there, right, who, 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 who wants to compete. And if that athlete is unwilling to discipline their body by regular exercise or abstinence, that athlete is not free to excel on the track or on the field. That failure to train rigorously denies that athlete the freedom to run with the desired speed and endurance. See, we glory in liberty. We glory in I can do whatever I want and this is not true of the Christian life. We are bound and when we are bound by God to focus on what He wants to focus on, then we experience the most freedom. How does this look like in the Gospels? Write down these two words if you would. What you have in the Gospels of Jesus, the the historical record of, of the eyewitnesses of Christ, what you have on display repeatedly are are 
two actions that happen. There's a plea from the person that is desperate for God. There's the plea, right? The plea. And here's the plea. Have mercy on me, O God, a sinner. When was the last time you prayed that prayer before God? Can I tell you, it is probably the one prayer we need to pray constantly. You have men and women who are desperate. The blind, the broken, the pariahs of their day, they have nothing but to throw themselves in the path of Christ and cry out, have mercy on me, O oh God, a sinner. And Jesus then asks a question. Don't miss this. What would you have me do? So you have the plea, and then you've got the question. This is what the process looks like. We who are broken and blind and downtrodden and diseased and wretched and wicked, we have nothing but to throw ourselves in the path of the Savior. And then he asks us the question, what do you want me to do? And this is the level where that spiritual journey begins to unfold because his question penetrates the very core of who we are because he's forcing us to come face to face with our humanness with our vulnerability with our need and until God can get to that place you're going to live a false reality let me say it another way the truest thing about you is the place where you need God's help the most. Let me say it another way. You're only as strong where you're most spiritually weak. But we don't believe that. We buy into, well, I'll just focus on my strengths and ignore those areas where I fall short. Picture a wooden bucket, right? It's got wooden slats all, all the way around it, right? You could have slats that are this high, but if there's one slat that's this high, how, how much water can that bucket hold? Only as much as that lowest slat rises. We have great need, ladies and gentlemen. We have deep vulnerabilities. We are raised, being raised in a culture that says, you keep your humanness to yourself. And yet it's that light that Jesus shines upon that, those very areas that we want to just run from. That God says, then you'll never understand the true you until you allow me into those places. And that's what the spiritual disciplines allow. I mean, my wife is sick right now. My wife is a workhorse. She doesn't know how to slow down. And as a husband, here's, here's the message I've been preaching to her. Stop. Rest. Relax. Be. She is a woman who finds so much of her identity in being a wife. And a mom. And a teacher. And I want her to know that here's a season where those things, though they're important, ultimately do not matter to who she is as a person created in the image of God. Quit leaning on all your external busyness and just stop and be centered in the core of who God has made you to be. People will still love you, Lori, for not being a music teacher. Amen? People will still love you, Lori, for not singing with the band on Sunday. Amen? People will stop, they will still love you, Lori, for not making sure there's a hot meal on the table every night. Amen? I have a hard time with that one. <laughs> and I tell you, for the past three weeks, I've been living 
as best as I can to our marriage vows some 26 years ago where I said, I will love you through sickness and in health. Because my wife needs to understand she's more valuable for who she is in create, being created in the image of God than anything she can do for me or anyone else. Literally, I was going to send her out of the house the other day with duct tape on her mouth and write vow of silence on the duct tape. Because she just needs to stop talking. She needs to relax. We're going to watch golf today and drink some beers and hopefully relax. We have date day tomorrow. Which means we'll go to a movie and we won't have to say anything to each other. Just eat buttery popcorn and enjoy the show, right? But these are hard things for, for... We fill our lives with busyness and those things can be good things, but when it comes to the ultimate thing of just being in connection with who you are and your weakness and your humanness and your vulnerabilities, nothing is more important than allowing God into those places. Amen? I'm thankful for a church. Can I, can I brag on you guys? I'm thankful for a church where you're sitting there going, not, where's Lori today? Because as your wife, she should be here. But you guys are like, how's your wife doing? Not like, where is she? Because her presence here is not what makes her important. You guys are like, how's your wife? And I'm actually getting a little tired of it, jokingly, right? Like, I almost want to put something on recording like here's how she's doing because so many of you have asked and I appreciate that but I love that because this is the kind of culture we want, we want to create not like we're keeping track of our church attendance with each other but more how is your health and you're concerned about her physical health how much more should we be concerned about loving each other as we are where we are and allowing God to show up to do the work that only he can do in our humanness and our weakness and our, our vulnerability. Ladies and gentlemen, amen. I want to be a part of that culture. You guys are loving and forgiving and I'm excited what God's going to do here. All right, number, where are we? Number four, I think. D? How many letters are there? Who, who put together these notes? Come on, you guys. She did? You going to report on that? Okay. Oh, good. Tell her there better be a hot meal ready. All right, so <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. All right. Amen. Thanks, Cheryl. Uh, this is how we do things in our house. So we laugh a lot. And I, and I hate making her laugh right now because her, her chest hurts. So um, the disciplines and the priority. We're going to blow through these things fast. The disciplines and the priority. Ladies and gentlemen, this, is, this has got to be priority business. There was a guy who once said, the reason we're not able to see God is the faintness of our desire. Man, if there's one thing I want God to really build within us is a desire for Him. Because there is danger in ne neglecting these disciplines. The, there's so many things in Scripture that promote this idea of a priority, this urgency. First Peter chapter 1, Peter writes, you know, like, God is holy, therefore He wants holiness from us. You shall be holy, for I am holy. 1 Peter chapter 1. How about Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14? The writer of Hebrews says this. Strive for peace with everyone. Agonize. Pursue it. And for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Why is this important? Because I want you to see God. Why is this important? Because I want you to be in His presence. If you don't know where God is, you'll never be able to receive the loving grace and mercy that He offers. This is why the psalmist so masterfully says in Psalm 73, one of my all-time favorite psalms, he cries out to God, Whom am I in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Notice there's nothing there about church attendance. There's nothing there about Bible memorization. There's nothing there with epic priestly prayers. There's nothing like that. The, the cry of the heart of a person that desires God is exactly this. You and only you is what I'm desperate for, Lord. Peter, with Jesus, oh my goodness. Jesus is teaching some hard teachings in John chapter 6. And notice what Peter says. 
you know, this is where Pe Jesus turns to Peter and says, are you going to go away from me too? Like, are you going to turn away from my teaching and my presence and my relationship? And Peter goes, Lord, to whom shall I go? Like, you have the words of eternal life and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Like, literally, I wonder how many times Jesus is saying, really, you're leaving me? You're following this, you're listening to this? And we should be like Peter where we say, who else do I need to go to? You're it. You're all I need. The paralytic in John chapter 5. Write it down, look at it later. Here's the priority, you guys. The priority is that God works through our lame excuses. Don't we have lame excuses for this stuff not to happen? So here's the paralytic, John chapter 5. Jesus walks up and the man says, will you help me down to the pool where there's healing? And Jesus says, well, what's the problem? He says, well, there's two problems. One is I have no one to carry me down there. And number two, if someone does carry me down there, someone always butts in and gets there before I do. And Jesus sits there and says, stop your lame excuses. Take up your mat and stand. And he does it. Because this wasn't about him getting to the water. This was about him just obeying the voice of Jesus. Stop the lame excuses, you guys. But I can't, I can't. You're, there's going to be so many disciplines that God wants you to embrace. They are not optional. It is your choice. And if you choose not to embrace them because of some lame excuse, that reveals more that your heart is disobedient than it is that God's empowering you something to, to spend time with him, to grow in him. Because this man did what he was told to do, he experienced Jesus' healing power. Will you do what Jesus asked you to do? Number F, E. Number E. The disciplines and the practice. You guys have heard me say this a lot, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it one more time because this is something we need to hold in tension while we talk about the disciplines in the weeks to come. God loves desire more than he loves competence. Okay? Because what I am not selling you is this pathway to adopt exercises that you will ultimately perfect. This will not happen. I still am a horrible prayer at times. I am still a horrible reader of God's word at times. I am still horrible in sharing my faith with other people at times. And God continues to tell me that these are things that you never arrive at, but they're things that we need to continue to work on. He loves desire more than he loves competence. So soccer season started in our household with our two boys. And, and my little Hudson, I love Hudson so much. He's, you know, he's a stocky kid, right? And uh, he'd probably be better for football than for soccer, but he loves soccer. And literally he aspires to be like the next Cristiano Ronaldo. And I'm sitting in the back of my mind trying to be realistic to him like, dude, there's got to be a lot of training that happens if you want to hit that level of, of competitiveness. But that aside, first couple practices, he was so defeated. Because he's like, all the other kids on my team are so much better than me. And I just said, you know what? You just, this is what practice is for, right? Practice is just develop the skills and get out there and run with these kids. And, you know, they're doing laps. Hudson's the last one to finish the lap. He's the, he's the last one on the field. So they had their first game yesterday. And guess who outran all the other kids on the field? They still lost 11 to 1. But I'm going to tell you right now. He ran his heart out. And at the end of the game, the coach did a huddle. And he said, there's one player I want to commend today, and that's Hudson. And I'm sitting there going, yeah. And there's like a little tear out of my eye, right? You know? And I just was so proud, right? Because the desire was there. This had nothing to do with competence had nothing to do with winning. It had nothing to do with scoring a goal. had everything to do with him showing up and giving his best. Amen? 
Ladies and gentlemen, the Christian journey is not a sprint. It is a marathon. And as someone who's run one marathon in my life, yes, off my bucket list, hardest thing in the world I ever had to do, I'm going to tell you what, it takes a lot of training to do that. And this is not about completing one discipline and then moving on to the next. This is about holding all the disciplines God has given to us in constant tension with with each other so that we can grow in the grace and mercy of our God evermore. Amen? None of these disciplines were absent in the life of Christ. And that's one thing we're going to learn as we go through these practices. Everything we're going to talk about were true in the life of Jesus. This is why he can make such statements like Luke 9, 23. You wish to be my disciple, he says. Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Jesus says, you want a a role model? It's me. You want a picture of what God's going to do in you? Look at me. And perhaps this is what made Matthew 11, this passage, so remarkable. Not only does he say, come to me all you who who labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Notice what he says, take my yoke upon you. And learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. What is he saying here? Well, this is an agrarian culture where where they worked the land, and they had these oxen that would do the work, and they'd take an older oxen who knew the ways, and they put this wooden thing on the oxen's neck called a yoke, and it not only had room for one oxen, but it had room for another so that the younger could be trained by the older. And so Jesus says, take the yoke, that is around my neck. There's room for you. Now walk with me and learn the path. Walk with me and learn the journey. Walk with me and learn the steps. And this is what Jesus invites us into. To learn from Him. And He's not concerned about the right steps and the right action and the right doing. He's concerned with you becoming the right person. The one that reflects his image well. And we'll talk more about this as we go through the disciplines. Last point, we're done. The disciplines and the pursuit. And again, I'm going to just end with this message of urgency, ladies and gentlemen. Da Vinci drew over a thousand hands before he did one of his famous paintings. Edison failed with a thousand incandescent light bulbs before he came up with the one true light bulb, right? Joshua Heifetz, one of the greatest violinists of the 20th century, practiced for 102,000 hours. Michael Jordan, tens of thousands of free throws. Tiger Woods, tens of thousands of hours out on the driving range. Ladies and gentlemen, nothing significant that you want to accomplish will ever be done without discipline. So there needs to be this pursuit and godliness is a lifelong pursuit. Psalm 70, 42. I'm sure 72 is good, but 42 is what we're going to look at this morning. As the deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul pants for you, O God. Why is this a priority? Because it's something you hunger and thirst for. Which is why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be satisfied. This is why the words of Hebrews is so important. Strive for peace with everyone. For that holiness, no one will see the Lord. And then we come right back full circle to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, right? Command these things to you so that you may be without reproach. Uh, that should be chapter 4, verse 7. Train yourself for the purpose of godliness. I probably wrote it down wrong. You guys are good. Train yourself for the purpose of godliness. Let me close with this. You guys remember a show called Everybody Loves Raymond? So Ray Romano went from this this comedian that could hardly fill a room to having this very popular sitcom called Everybody Loves Raymond. And on the last episode after they were done filming, Ray Romano came out to the audience to thank the audience for their years of support. And he pulled out of his pocket a letter that was given to him from his brother when he went to Hollywood to pursue this this show. And he read this note that he had packed in his bags that he had held on for nine years. And he opened up the letter and here's what he read to the audience after the final taping. His brother Richard wrote, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world yet loses his soul? 
That's what his brother wrote in the letter. Romano folded it up, put it in his pocket, and he said to the audience, now I'm going to work on my soul. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, now it's time to work on our souls. Amen? Let's stand, let's pray. Father, I am excited for what you are prepared to do in the lives of these brothers and sisters in Christ. I am excited to open up the word, to learn the disciplines, to, to instruct on these important things that you have given to us to simply place ourselves in your presence. Lord, in my prayer is that we, we understand the disciplines to be merely that. Ways we can put ourselves in your presence. So that we can see you. So that we can hear you. So that we can connect with you. God, I pray that this does not re become just another religious exercise for the sake of activity. But that these disciplines that we will look at will promote godliness, will promote the gospel of Christ, will bring you glory. And that this will be the greatest thing we have ever feasted upon, you and your presence. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you, Father, for taking care of us. Thank you, Father, for knowing us better than we know ourselves. And thank you, God, for providing a plan for our lives. May we walk in these things for your glory and our good. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Next week, the Bible as discipline. What does that mean? We'll be back at then. Thanks. Hey, thanks for watching the video. We uh, hope you've been blessed and encouraged by, uh, by watching it. Stay tuned for future videos. Uh, if you're ever in the Phoenix area, we'd love for you to join us in person at Sozo Coffee. We're at Warner and Alma School. Two services every Sunday, 9 and 1045. Check out the churchisaverb.org for more information. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.